We're very pleased to have our conversation today with the ambassador to the United States from Poland, Marek Magyarowski. Did I pronounce that correctly? Correct. Okay. And um, he is, he just came from a, a meeting with uh, some people at the Pentagon, so we'll hear the latest about that, hopefully. You won't. And uh, he is by trade uh, and training a journalist. He was a editor, columnist, uh, journalist for some 20 years before he joined the president's, uh, the chancery, the White House, the, the main operation of the president of Poland. And subsequent to that, he led the press operation uh, for the chancery and subsequently. Quite miserably. Well, pretty, well, did a pretty good job. And then you uh, also became the uh, deputy foreign minister. After that, you became ambassador to Israel, served there for three years. And as of November 23rd, last year, you became the ambassador here, right? Exactly. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Poland right now. Poland has done an incredible job of trying to support the Ukrainians. Is that very popular in Poland to be doing this or not? According to a recent poll which came out just a few days ago, about 70% of the Polish population has been somehow involved in this okay. kind of, of humanitarian assistance to Ukrainians. And uh, I, I've said this on uh, several occasions that uh, in our case, this is probably the first uh, humanitarian crisis in Europe's history in which uh, the host country does not need to build refugee camps for all those migrants who have crossed the border with Poland since the beginning of the hostilities. I mean, you're saying it is reasonably popular because a lot of people are participating in doing this, so. I would be very frugal in using the term popular because it's, uh, it's also a burden. Well, that's uh, what I wanted to ask you about. Why? Yeah. It's gonna cost Poland a lot of money and uh, and you're taking refugees in, are you expecting these refugees are going to stay forever or are they going to go back? There has been an, uh, a remarkable outpouring of solidarity and sympathy towards our Ukrainian brethren. Also because we know the Russian, or the Soviet mentality, if you will. So we felt obliged to help them. Uh, most of those families who fled Ukraine are now hosted uh, by Polish families in Polish homes. And that's why I mentioned those refugee camps. There were, by the way, uh, a few congressional delegations coming to Warsaw and uh, to Poland over the last couple of weeks. And many of them were asking their uh, counterparts from the Polish parliament, uh, uh, Polish officials, where are the refugee camps? We would like to visit one. Wow. And uh, the answer they always got was, there are, there are none, because we don't need them. Of course, as I said, this is also, it, Poland is filling up. Right now, uh, 2.8 million refugees who have already found safe shelter in Poland. But, uh, for example, they concentrate in big cities, Warsaw, Wrocław, Gdańsk, Poznan. Right. So we would like to put it bluntly. We would like to spread them out a little bit. Of course, some of them re-immigrated to other countries like Germany, Sweden, France. Some of them returned to Ukraine. By the way, uh, there was fertile ground for the absorption of those refugees uh, after the invasion began, because before the war, uh, we had about 1.5 million Ukrainians living and working in Poland, and they were integrating so smoothly, so impeccably into the Polish society. Uh, they, they used to learn the language in a matter of months, perhaps because these two languages are so similar to each other. They have similar cultural background, uh, historical roots, uh, and that's why, for example, now all those uh, uh, subsequent waves of refugees from Ukraine are also integrating uh, pretty quickly. Okay, but of the 2.3 million or so that have now come in, 2.8. 2.8. So do you expect that most of them will stay or eventually most of them will go back? Uh, some of them have already decided to, to, uh, to return to Ukraine, uh, mostly to the western part or to Kiev. Uh, but many of them uh, think about uh, staying permanently in Poland, also because many of them hope that this war will end soon. I'm, I'm also keeping my fingers crossed for this war to end as quickly as possible. Uh, they have families and relatives in Poland already. So, uh, and that's why, for example, that, as I said, they concentrate in big cities because this is where their relatives live too. I should say, my daughter has been volunteering on weekends to go to Poland to work on the Red Cross, and she just got back, and she's told me there's a lot of American troops over there and NATO troops. Uh, what are they all doing over there? They're just helping the 
Ukrainian First of all, we need more. Okay. And, and uh, th th this is one of the subjects to, uh, our Defense Minister and Secretary of Defense Austin touched upon during their, uh, their conversation just a few minutes ago. Uh, well, uh, we've had American troops for several years now on Polish soil stationed not permanently on a rotational basis. And this is one of the issues we are, we are talking about with our American partners, how to, uh, how to promote this presence of U.S. trips to, uh, to the higher level. And do you want to have American troops there longer or you want to have them there shorter? Uh, we want them to stay permanently in Poland, also in light of the growing aggressiveness of our uh, okay. Russian neighbor. And I think that this conviction that uh, the eastern flag, not only Poland, but also all those countries located geographically in this, in our part of Europe, should be strengthened militarily. And uh, this is, of course, this will be absolutely beneficial to our collective security. Well, if the American troops were to stay there longer, um, the theory would be that that provides you greater protection against the Russians coming in. Is that the idea? Uh, this is the idea. Of course, we, we, uh, we are uh, a member of NATO. Poland is also a member and a very active one in the European Union. We don't fear Russian aggression now. I think Russians are more concerned about our potential reaction to their hypothetical incursion into one of uh, NATO countries. I hope it, will, it won't be Poland. But on the other hand, I do believe after uh, analyzing and trying to read into the mind of President Putin, which is always a risky business, I don't have that much hubris to, right. to lay out my own analysis of what he really thinks well, about, the future, about the future of his own country and about, about the future of Europe. But uh, I do believe that uh, uh, Ukraine is not the last item on his menu. All right. So, all right. Uh, why do you think Putin is trying to do what he's doing? He wants to take over all of Ukraine and have it be a... He dreams of winning the Cold War, but not the new one. Sometimes we are talking about a new Cold War unfolding in front of our eyes in Europe. I think he dreams of winning the old Cold War, which... Uh, uh, well, basically ended at the beginning of the 90s. It's like adding a new twist to a movie or rewriting the script yeah. altogether. This is his main ambition. Well, how long do you think this war will go on at this point? It seems that it will be a protracted conflict. Now the Russians are regrouping and moving their units to the eastern part of Ukraine. The character of this war itself is changing as we speak because uh, from the very beginning as it has been a land war uh, in spite of the fact that one of the most spectacular events in that war was the sinking of the Moskva cruiser. Uh, but it has been a land war, and it will be uh, more of a long land war right now. Uh, um, clashes and battles of tanks. It's like, uh, you know, um, returning to, to the times of, the, of World War II. So uh, you think that this could go on for quite some time, but you think at some point Putin would like an off-ramp so he could say, I won, I got something. What is it you think he now thinks he needs to get to be able to say he can end this? Is there something no matter, No matter how this war ends. And uh, again, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, and I think that Ukraine will prevail, and the Russian army will be eventually crushed in Ukraine, uh, regardless of the final outcome of this uh, uh, conflict. Uh, Putin has to sell it as a victory. And we are approaching now the, uh, a turning point, a crucial moment, which will be the, the uh, May the 9th, the victory parade on the Red Square in Moscow. And he will feel uh, obliged to sell uh, this military operation in Ukraine as um, a success, as a military achievement of the Russian Federation. I wonder how he will do it. Uh, paradoxically, now with the Russians living mostly in an information bubble, because they have been, uh, f well, essentially cut off from uh, from unbiased information and uh, and uh, uh, objective media coverage, he he can do it. He can sell this defeat in Ukraine, and I uh, again, hopefully, it will be a defeat for the Russian army and for for the Russian Russian Federation as victory. Well. Um, right now, he's more popular in Russia than he was before the military operation. Is that right? At least that's what the polls say. It's, uh, uh, we need a pinch of salt. 
okay. trying to analyze all those polls which have uh, been published recently in Russia because it's uh, very hard to believe that uh, okay. those, those polls and those surveys are, are fully credible. But why do you think the Russians were so ill-prepared to take over Kiev, for example? They didn't seem to have their military act together. I don't know how many books on wartime logistics all those Russian commanders have read in their lives. I've read some. <laughs> I'm not a military expert. But it, 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 it has been a, a profound and grave embarrassment for the Russian army, which uh, is a, a good sign and a bad sign uh, at the same time. Because, you know, the attrition rate, for example, of, of their uh, combat material is extraordinary. So they are they're losing equipment, they're losing manpower. So the Russian army now is much, much, way weaker than it was at the beginning of the invasion, which is a very positive development from our viewpoint. Well, are there new soldiers coming in from Russia, or are there people coming in, soldiers from Syria or Chechnya? Who's, who's doing the fighting now? We have not yet any evidence of the presence of those Syrian or, uh, well, mostly Syrian or Libyan fighters uh, uh, coming to Ukraine, some Chechen fighters too, although many of those uh, video clips you can see on Twitter and on other social media are probably fake uh, because they are, there was that, that uh, clip with uh, Chechen fighters uh, firing shells against uh, you know, uh, some signage on the streets of, of uh, Kharkiv. Uh, it's hilarious, of course, but on the other hand, of course, uh, th there is a shortage of manpower now on the, on the Russian side and that's why, for example, I think that Putin will try to, to mobilize the society and to, uh, and to, to mobilize, literally, uh, those uh, young lads, those poor conscripts, which will be sent to Ukraine shortly. Suppose um, the Russians kind of control the eastern part of Ukraine, Donbass area, which they more or less controlled for a while, and they keep Crimea, um, and he says, okay, we have the independent republic or whatever he's going to call it of donbass we've got crimea we we call it a day would that be this is a plausible scenario as i said he has to sell this operation as a victory uh, he has but you know on the other hand we are still thinking about how to um about a, the, all those possible plausible scenarios after the war and um, i believe there will be a tremendous pressure on the part of at least some European countries to return to normalcy in our relationship with, uh, okay. with Russia, uh, both in terms of our trade and political relations with that uh, country. And it will be very perilous oh. in terms of our, of our political uh, standing. Uh, right now, we are in the middle of a very interesting and intriguing discussion about Germany's stance, for example. Uh, Germany is, uh, the, the, the German government is arguing that uh, Firstly, for example, that closing all loopholes in the, uh, in the sanctions package that we have imposed, we, uh, I mean the European Union and also the United States and some other superpowers have imposed on Russia, we have to close all those loopholes. And this is, for example, the Polish government's priority. We are talking about blocking imports of oil, coal and gas and other uh, commodities from Russia. The Polish government announced a few weeks ago that we are going to, uh, to uh, give up uh, our uh, imports of coal uh, uh, immediately, then okay. imports of gas by the end of the year. Uh, but uh, some other countries in Europe are pretty hesitant and well, they are because they are too reliant on imports of Russian uh, raw materials. But Germany gets like 40% of its yeah. uh, energy from the Russian gas, I guess it is. So what percentage of your energy is dependent on Russian gas and Russian oil? Uh, it's much less. Uh, on the other hand, Where do you get additionally, additionally, we were much more prescient, if you will, than other European countries because we thought about uh, our energy security in a, in a longer term many years ago. And that's why, for example, we decided many years ago to render Poland uh, entirely independent of imports of Russian gas. We started building uh, and we inaugurated the first LNG terminal on the Polish stretch of the Baltic coast in 2016. Your energy comes mostly, though, from where? From coal. The, we have never, and we will never, recognize uh, Russian jurisdiction over Crimea and Russian jurisdiction over those two breakaway provinces in the east. It's absolutely impossible. Uh, uh, the Polish, the current Polish government 
and any other Polish government, no matter the political affiliation and political colors, will never recognize okay. Crimea as Russian territory. Well, what, what about the sanctions, though? Uh, would, you, would you lift the sanctions? I mean, how much longer after the... I will give you some uh, very specific conditions uh, which are not yet official. This is my personal view. But I believe that if we, if we, even, if we want to even start thinking about easing up on those restrictions that you have just mentioned, or lifting part of the sanctions, there are some obvious conditions. First of all, Russia has to withdraw all its troops from not only Ukraine proper, but also from uh, Crimea, and all those territories which were annexed and occupied in 2014. They have to pay war reparations to Ukraine. You can't even imagine the scale of devastation caused by Russian troops in Ukraine. It's hundreds of billions of dollars of, of, of material losses that Ukraine has suffered uh, over the last, how many, five weeks. It's hundreds but of billions of dollars. But is it realistic that you can ever get Russia to agree If we don't think it's realistic, we can already okay, so surrender to Russia. Now, there's no sympathy that a lot of people... Uh, another point, excuse yes. me. Uh, war crimes. And this is, I know it's a very sensitive issue. And many politicians in the West have been very reticent until recently using the term genocide in, in, uh, when we look at what is going on in Ukraine and all those unspeakable, horrendous, abhorrent crimes committed by Russian troops in, in Lviv, in Kharkiv, in, in Mariupol, in Bucha. We have seen have overwhelming evidence of uh, war crimes and genocidal tendencies, not only among Russian troops, but also in the Russian political elites. It's absolutely uh, unimaginable that uh, the Russian president officially and openly, openly praises the unit which committed right. those atrocities in Bucha. We all saw, well, and the, pre the, the Russian president praised the soldiers which, who participated in those but there, Nobody would defend that in the West, certainly, but the issue, in the case of war crime trials, they only occur when somebody is out of power and they're no longer running their own government. So as long as Putin is running the government, how can you really have a war crime trial? It's uh, difficult. On the other hand, Russia, for example, is not uh, a party to the ICC, to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. So maybe we would have we would have to establish a new okay. tribunal, uh, an international uh, institution, which would uh, justly try and sentence all those Russian war criminals. So uh, a famous Washington journalist, Michael Kinsley, once said, "A gaffe, a mistake by a politician, is when he says." I'm familiar with gaffes, right? Me. Okay, so that means that a politician actually said something that is truthful, but he couldn't wasn't supposed to say that. Some people would say that President Biden had a gaffe when he said, we need to get rid of Putin. What is your government's position? Should Putin stay in power after there's an armistice, or do you really need to get him to go? Our position is pretty clear. It's up to the Russian people to elect uh, their own political leaders. It's a pity that uh, this great country with such great culture has a leader who is an, um, an autocrat, with racist tendencies, and I'm not, I'm not refraining from using this term, uh, oppressing not only uh, Ukraine nowadays, but also his own people. I, uh, you know, by the way, Putin, I believe, has accomplished pretty paradoxically what we have been struggling to achieve for so many years. He has strengthened the Ukrainian national identity. He has proven that Russians and Ukrainians are not the same people. He has reinvigorated the European Union. Uh, I'm, I'm, a Euro, I'm, I'm perceived as a Europhile in, back in Poland, but I, I never believed that the, the, the Russian president would uh, revitalize this well, organization. He has pushed Sweden and Finland towards NATO. These two countries will join in NATO shortly. So a master strategist. Well, this is what's called it? the law of unintended consequences, yeah. right? So look what he's done. Nobody else was able to do that. But let me ask you about uh, your country you were an ambassador at before. Israel, which is a democratic I country. I feared that, yeah. Is a democratic country, uh, most people would say, I think. 
Um, not everybody, but most people would say it's a democratic country and therefore a country that you would think would line up behind Ukraine, but they didn't do so. Why is that? Firstly, I, I would like to, to stress one thing clearly, that uh, for every Polish diplomat accredited to Israel, a three-year stint is like a 30-year tenure in any other country. So if, if, you can, if you can see all those gray hairs in my head, uh, this is Israel. Uh, but seriously, I, I fell in love with, uh, with uh, the people, I fell in love with the country, with their culture, with their uh, remarkable past, uh, which uh, we, par we, we partially share this past with Israel, as you perfectly know. It's a very, complicated, a very complex uh, history. So it was pretty complicated for me as a Polish diplomat to, for example, explain all those nuances of our uh, bilateral relationship, but also of our relations with Russia. I will give you one, one telling example. There is a, uh, uh, every year there is a, the so-called Veterans Day uh, uh, celebrated in Israel. Uh, basically, the, the, the Israeli uh, uh, political class commemorates the sacrifice uh, made by the Red Army, which as you know, for example, liberated uh, the Auschwitz concentration, the, the, the Auschwitz death camp. And this is the first association that comes to the mind of most Israelis when I mentioned the Soviet Union or the Red Army. They say, oh, the Red Army liberated uh, not only the Auschwitz concentration camp, but uh, they, they insinuate that the, the Russian army liberated Europe from Nazism. And then the discussion begins, because as you know, our perception of the Red Army is a little bit different. Well, but so so uh, among many other areas in which we had our disagreements with Israel, it was one of the, well, it was a, uh, actually a, a side dish, right? But it was also a very important uh, topic where I had to touch upon in, in, in well, countless discussions but with were you, you Israeli were, interlocutors. Or were you criticized in Israel because people would say that the concentration camps were in Poland? And so oh, therefore... Yeah, that's, um, how many hours do we have to talk about okay. that? Okay, so right now, back to Israel, are you surprised that the Israeli government is trying to be an intermediary and you think that it's likely to be successful in getting the war to end? Well, uh, to put it diplomatically, uh, a bit disappointed. Not surprised, because uh, uh, a phrase I heard on multiple occasions in Israel was, Russia is our neighbor now. Not geographically, but certainly geopolitically. And they, uh, they meant uh, Russian military presence in the Middle East, mostly in Syria. So they have that uh, deconfliction agreement with Russia, uh, which allows them to carry out the uh, air operations in Syria, targeting, uh, 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 attacking Iranian targets in that country. So it's very important for them to maintain a decent relationship with Russia. So it's on the, on the, one, uh, on the one hand, it's understandable. But on the other hand, this is where we clash with Israel in terms of our relationship with Russia. Okay. One of the other former uh, Soviet uh, um, satellite countries, Hungary, now seems to be fairly steadily in the camp of Russia. Um, is that a problem for Poland to have Hungary? It is. It is, definitely, because Hungary is part of the Visegrad group, which plays a very important role within the European Union. And we have been coordinating our policies uh, also at the European level. But, uh, but, but uh, for example, Hungary is a NATO member country, too. So this is, this is again, a little bit uh, disappointing for, uh, from our perspective. How do you coordinate policies because they might be leaking what you're thinking about doing to the Russians? You it is a problem. That? It is a problem. But uh, I had a, a few weeks ago, I had a very a friendly chat with Gregory Mix, who is the chairman of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee on, uh, in the House. And uh, uh, it was a, a meeting of uh, some ambassadors from, from the eastern flank. And he asked us about what our view was on the, um, intelligence sharing uh, among uh, those countries in Europe and the United States. And I was trying to explain to him that uh, paradoxically, nowadays, if, uh, if you share intelligence with us, with Poland, with the Czech Republic, with Slovakia, uh, with the Balkan countries, it's uh, safer than sharing intelligence 
with Germany or in, with France because of those, uh, of those business ties which are so strong uh, between Germany, France and Russia. I didn't mention Hungary, of course, and again, I wouldn't like to comment on this because it's, uh, it's very, it, is a, it is a very ticklish issue also for us. We would like to maintain a decent and a good uh, relationship with Hungary, which has always been our partner and ally in, uh, in uh, a number, in an array of dimensions. So um, again, it's, it's, it's pretty disappointing, and we will be trying to persuade our Hungarian uh, partners that they are not exactly on the, on the right side of uh, history is, is right now. Is there any air between you and Germany, or the German government and the Polish government, you see eye to eye on Ukraine? Uh, probably not. We okay. heard we heard those uh, that announcement of the German Chancellor yesterday. Uh, uh, they are, as I said, much more hesitant and much more reluctant to, for example, to deliver weaponry uh, to Ukraine. Their relationship with Russia, as you rightly noted, 55% of their energy needs are, I mean, gas needs are covered by inputs from Russia. So it's a completely different situation. On the other hand, we do realize and we are acutely aware of Germany's role within the European Union. It is uh, uh, a very important, our most important trading partner, uh, a political giant, but militarily, I wouldn't use the term dwarf, but militarily Germany is much weaker than it used to be. And paradoxically, uh, now a majority of Poles, this is my uh, impression, uh, an overwhelming majority of my fellow countrymen uh, wish Germany spent more on its right. military than less. We would, we, would like, we would prefer Germany to have our back what do you because think? it's a very important ally and partner in these two organizations. If Merkel were the chancellor still of Germany, would it make a difference? Hard to say. Uh, I'm not a soothsayer. Well, just uh, guess. You think she's a strong... <laughs> it would be a very wild guess. Uh, no, I think this is, a, it's, um, this is a, a comparison frequently used by politicians and pundits. Germany, like America, is like a, like, like a, a big aircraft carrier. So it's very difficult to change course, uh, regardless of uh, who rules Germany right now, be it the Conservatives, be it the Social Democrats, be it the Greens. Now there are some, uh, there is a rift, and there, there are some frictions uh, were inside the German government because, uh, interestingly, the Greens are much more outspoken and much more vociferous in terms of punishing Russia and uh, tightening this economic news and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, strengthening the sanctions regime. Do you have any evidence that China is providing military or economic support to I Russia? I don't. Do you think they are? They just don't have evidence? We don't know. Uh, I have uh, a very deep appreciation for all the capabilities of our Polish okay. intelligence, but uh, I don't have much knowledge okay. about... Uh, so today, um, the President of the United States has said, we're not sending American military troops, ground troops, into Ukraine. Um, are there Polish ground troops in Ukraine? No, there aren't. But uh, Poland, and it's no secret that Poland has become a hub for weapons deliveries to Ukraine, okay. and we are very proud of that, and we do believe that, uh, as I've said on, on, uh, uh, repeatedly, that uh, Ukraine is now fighting not only for their freedom and for their independence and for their sovereignty, they're also fighting for us, they're also fighting for our values. And uh, of course we can't engage in a major military confrontation with Russia, we can't technically and legally defend Ukraine, because Ukraine is not a NATO country, but uh, we can do our, and we should do our utmost to help Ukrainians defend themselves and defend us. Now, Poland is a member of NATO, and uh, under the uh, um, agreement of NATO, if, if, if Poland is attacked, all members of the uh, NATO would defend Poland. Yeah. But do you think it's actually true that if Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia were attacked, Tiny little countries. I have no doubts whatsoever about uh, uh, NATO countries' willingness and readiness to defend also the Baltics, not only Poland, uh, all the countries on the eastern okay. flank. I do believe, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty adamant, uh, as is the Polish government, 
uh, that Article 5 is absolutely sacrosanct. Okay. And um, let me ask you about uh, uh, Poland as a weapons uh, facilitator. Your weapons are being delivered over from the United States, I guess, to either to Poland or Romania, and then you help facilitate getting them into Ukraine. How do you get them in there? I'd like to know that, too. You don't know? I, I don't assume know. you have secret routes or something. I, actually, I prefer not to know many. Okay. <laughs> so um, let me switch for a second uh, and talk about uh, Poland itself. So how many people live in Poland? 38 million. And uh, the religion is predominantly Catholic? Catholic, yes. It's not 93, 95 percent. Okay. And not all, of, not all of them, regrettably, not all of them attend church every Sunday. And uh, the Jewish population was wiped out in World War II, but is there some Jewish population? Between five, to, uh, between five and 10,000 people of the Jewish descent. Five and 10,000? Yes, living now in Poland. Okay, so what is the biggest export of Poland? Apples. Apples? Yeah. What's the biggest import? Uh, energy. Well, yes, energy. Okay, so not long ago, the Polish government said, well, we have some MiG jets, and yeah. why don't we supply these MiG jets, and you, the U.S. can make up to that with some other planes. Why didn't that work? There was some controversy which arose around that uh, particular issue. I will explain this to you um, in detail. Uh, it was Joseph Borrell, the high representative uh, of the European Union, who uh, first proposed to deliver those aircraft uh, to Ukraine. I've got the impression that uh, in America there is a perception of those Soviet-made fighter jets. Uh, uh, they look like those B-52s, the Strato Fortresses, which are, you know, mass bold somewhere in the middle of the desert in Nevada, covered by dust, but uh, usable. No. Our MiGs, the Soviet-made fighter jets, were upgraded a few years ago. They are pretty modern, and they account for one-third of our fleet of combat aircraft. This leads me to a very obvious conclusion. We can't rid ourselves of one-third of our right. uh, 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 air capabilities without proper compensation or backfill, and that's why uh, the Polish government came up with that idea of uh, putting those aircraft at the disposal of NATO, uh, or uh, to be uh, more precise, at the disposal of the US government, to transfer them first to the, ba to the air base in Rammstein in Germany, and then if all NATO countries choose unanimously to transfer these airplanes further to Ukraine, we, we, uh, well, we we'll, would be fine by that, but uh, the, 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 the what, was, what was the objection? The American, the American government decided that it was not uh, right. the brightest idea, and uh, uh, it's it's still on the table. I mean, uh, it's still a valid proposal. Right. Although I, I, on the other hand, I, we, we try to understand, of course, the American position when they say that it would be a, too escalatory from the point of view of the of uh, of Russia. The U.S. government has taken the position there should not be a no-fly zone. Yeah. Um, do you agree with that? Does Polish government agree with that? Yes, because, um, as I said a few minutes ago, we don't need a military confrontation in Russia. Uh, I can only quote uh, okay. Jens Stoltenberg, the uh, NATO Secretary General, who have uh, already said on, on uh, several occasions that NATO is not at war with Russia, and it warned me. Uh, but, of course, NATO has also uh, a role in this conflict. Now, uh, from time to time, when President Putin gets upset, he mentions the word nuclear. Um, so, are you worried... My friends back in Poland freak out. Every time he says nuclear, believe me. But, no. you, I mean, you worried that he's going to use some kind of tactical nuclear weapon, or you just think it's threatening? Um, personally, I think it's bluff. But you never know. What about other types of weapons of mass destruction, chemical or biological, which may not be as easy to trace? Uh, well, we, we, uh, we heard Minister Lavrov saying that uh, at this stage, uh, Russia is not planning to use nuclear uh, weapons 
in Ukraine. We also had warnings on the part of the American administration that uh, chemical weapons would be deployed Same. in Ukraine. Uh, so far, this has not happened. Hopefully, it will not happen during this uh, conflict. But again, uh, both Putin and his closest aides, his generals, are so unpredictable that we have to be prepared for any scenario. So sometimes people write about nuclear weapons, they say, well, it's just a tactical nuclear weapon. Like, a tactical nuclear weapon doesn't kill millions of people. No, but so what, Anyway, what? it would be, it, it, uh, this would mean that uh, the Russians would cross the red line. Anyway, no matter the, the, the yield. I have already memorized so many fancy oh. terms. In, uh, what happens if... Military parlance. I, I think some Russian missiles have gone into Polish territory or Romanian territory or not? There was that uh, missile attack a few weeks ago, okay. which was just about 10 miles uh, from the Polish border. And people who, uh, who lived on the other side of the border, they, they saw uh, windows in their houses trembling from the blast. So it was uh, you know, a physical, uh, tangible proof that uh, we, uh, we are experiencing war just across our border. So it's, it's, it's troubling, it's disturbing also for Poles who live uh, not only uh, yeah. close to the Ukrainian border, but, but I said, well, half jokingly, that my, my friends in Poland uh, uh, freak out every time they, they hear Mr. Putin, uh, uh, you know, threatening us with the use of, uh, of his nuclear arsenal. But it's, it's true that it is, uh, you know, returning uh, at least mentally to the times of the Cold War. This is a very painful experience for many Poles uh, as well. The Russians have said they don't like the U.S. supplying these weapons to Ukrainians. Of course they don't. But presumably they don't like Poland helping out either. Suppose missiles were to fall on Poland directed from Russia. Would you think that at that point you would have to be at war with, with Russia and NATO would support you? Uh, President Biden once said, we are going to defend every inch of NATO territory. So that every inch of NATO territory is mostly in Poland. So. What is the chance, in your view, of Putin being deposed by people saying, hey, look, this is costing us too much money and aggravation and lives, and it's not worth the effort? Is that Quite frankly, I don't believe in a coup in the Kremlin, because if you, if you have created that, uh, and, and Putin ha has been pretty adamant about that, he has created an ambience of uh, fear and uh, distrust uh, within the walls of the Kremlin. So you can imagine Mr. Shoigu approaching Mr. Lavrov and saying to him, you know, this guy is insane. We have to topple him. And uh, you can expect Mr. Shoigu, uh, you know, tiptoeing into Putin's office and saying to him, you know, Mr. Lavrov told me that he wants to topple you. W what, what should I do about that? So the level of distrust in the Kremlin is so tremendous. Uh, I've never been there, of course, but uh, I can imagine from what I read and from what I see that uh, it's, it would be very difficult to even envisage such a scenario. Uh, social unrest in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, uh, the Russian society feeling the pinch of uh, sanctions. Uh, Why haven't the sanctions the economic had crisis, but of, uh, of uh, I mean, epic proportions, because this is what would we, we would need to even think about this uh, possible scenario of a social upheaval, which would eventually sweep away the current uh, uh, Russian political elites. There was a theory that as the body bags came back, uh, Russian mothers would be protesting in the streets but that doesn't seem to be happening yet. Why do you think not? Uh, uh, because they, you, you, you can't see those body bags on Russian TV. This is, this is the, the, the answer. And they don't, are they sending the body bags back? Because some people say they're taking, they have crematoriums that are mobile and they're just uh, incinerating the, these bodies. Uh, we don't have evidence of, of that, but uh, again, uh, the Russian society now lives in an information bubble. So they believe that uh, the, this military operation ha so far has been successful. So do you think if there is a, an armistice or a truce and, and Putin says, look, I really care about the oligarchs. I mean, they're, they're yachts need to go back and so forth. Is there any way in the world that you can see the Western allies giving back all the things that have been confiscated by the oligarchs? Uh, the European Union has committed itself to uh, transferring about half of 
uh, half a billion euros to Poland as a, a kind of an assistance uh, and uh, a compensation for what we have done already for Ukrainian refugees. Uh, $500 million is roughly the worth of one of those yachts owned by Russian oligarchs and confiscated by French or Italian authorities uh, in recent weeks. So this is the scale of uh, assets the Russian oligarchs uh, close to Putin still possess in the West. And that's why I, I said about the necessity to close all those loopholes wow. in the sanctions regime. For example, not, not all Russian banks have have been excluded yet from the SWIFT messaging system. So, the, the, for example, the ruble has strengthened and uh, the, the Moscow Stock Exchange has not uh, suffered uh, sufficiently and uh, as opposed to, to the expectations of many political leaders in the West. But your view is that the oligarchs' assets that have been confiscated almost certainly will not be given back? They'll be used for reparations or something yes, like that? Yes, if, if this is the decision of, of, of the, the Western political elites, that, that would be a, a nice one. Now, there's Russian uh, currency reserves that are in the West, and I think they've been uh, frozen. Do you think they should be given back? or uh, If it's legally possible, yes, they should. They should be given back. No, given, no, 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 given as the no. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I misunderstood you. Yeah, um, uh, if we are kept. talking about reparations, okay. if we are talking, no, no, absolutely, they are, they, the, many of them have been confiscated, many of them have been okay. seized. Now, let's talk about your background for a moment. Now, how do you get to be ambassador? Let's talk about this. So, you were a journalist. I'm nothing wrong with being Once a journalist, always a journalist. Right. Like a KGB officer. All right. So, you spent 20 years as a journalist, and then you went to the dark side, you were in, in the government. So, what prompted you to say, I've had enough of being a journalist? You think journalism is the, on the bright side? Well, it's... Sam, uh, what's your opinion? I don't know. <laughs> Still. So you think... Uh, so why did you get out of journalism? Well, uh, to be honest, I, it was in 2015 uh, when I transitioned to the Chancellery of the Polish President. I knew at the time, uh, I sensed what direction journalism was heading, uh, both in Poland and in other European countries and also in America because I had been covering also in the United States uh, in my previous uh, incarnation. And uh, it was becoming, at the time, it was already becoming tribal and so uh, profoundly affiliated with uh, political camps. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be a journalist in disguise. Okay. So I came to the conclusion that if I wanted to be a politician, so be it. I became a politician uh, with all the baggage and all the burden which uh, that implies because I knew, for example, it was funny because all of, uh, when I became the spokesperson, the press officer of my president, uh, all of a sudden I was standing in front of my former colleagues uh, with whom I was uh, on, on first name terms and they knew me, I knew them and they knew very well when I was manipulating them, when I, there was a one, one uh, caveat. I, all, I knew from the very beginning of my, of my new walk of life that I would never lie to them. But you enjoyed getting out of the... Oh, job. I did. Okay. So... Uh, Vastly. Now, why were you selected to be ambassador to uh, Israel? I don't know. Someone selected me, but... Uh, uh, well, I was, I, was, I was deputy foreign minister before that, uh, responsible for, okay. among many other galaxies, for both Americas, North America and Latin America, but also in a, in a certain period of time, all, I was also uh, responsible for the Middle East. And so okay. I, I dealt with Israel. So someone uh, quite cleverly, and uh, to my detriment, uh, came to the realization that maybe I would be the best candidate, knowing both sides okay. of this equation. So you didn't go on Ancestry.com to see whether you had any Jewish blood or anything in the background, no? <laughs> you, know, you never know if you've gone no, far No, no right. Jewish ancestry at all. But, uh, uh, well, it, I've, I've, I've always stressed the, the importance of this particular geopolitical triangle, Warsaw, Washington, okay. and Jerusalem. I should have said Tel Aviv. Warsaw, Washington, and... Uh, Where is your embassy? In Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. Um, 
Now, you have a facility for languages. You speak how many languages? It fluctuates. Fluctuates. I'll tell you why. I t according to people who, uh, who have much deeper expertise in this field than I do, you are uh, usually capable of speaking between four to five languages simultaneously and at the same level of fluency. Uh, now, I'm, for example, I'm forgetting Hebrew at a vertiginous pace. But, but, but uh, uh, even though I, have, I haven't been using this language, uh, I mean, right, physically so you, you and literally English. for a few months. English, Polish, what else? Uh, French? It's so embarrassing for me. Yes, French. So I only can do English, but I was curious how you can do all that. <laughs> English, French, Polish, Russian? Spanish. Spanish was the first foreign language I learned. German? Yes. Hebrew? I'm forgetting Hebrew, but wow, I, okay. still I'm... Right, so when you first became can, ambassador yeah. here, people weren't paying that much attention to you, I guess, right? I mean, when you came over here as ambassador, um, you know, in Washington, there are a lot of powerful people here, and often ambassadors are not getting all the attention. They're not the that States. powerful, yes. Right, so, I mean, was it hard to get a meeting with the president to present your credentials? You got that done right I away? I haven't met him yet. Oh. Uh, I, I presented my, my letters of credence uh, virtually, Oh, okay. And I got a very nice bag of chocolates from uh, President Biden. Uh, but okay. now, now uh, seriously, it was due to the pandemic, of course, that all those uh, ceremonies were suspended at the White House. But they are now returning to normalcy. So there was a, the first uh, batch of ambassadors who were received a few weeks ago at the White House. So I, I expect to be in the next one. But now everybody wants to talk to you, right? Because you're, you're an important country, more than maybe people thought it was before. So are you now spending all your time meeting with We are having government? this window of opportunity, to put it cynically. And I'm trying to, to, you know, to squeeze it and to use it as effectively as possible. Right. So what is the most common question people ask you about Poland? <sighs> oh, gosh. Uh, it's, well, I, I've been talking mostly about the refugee crisis for the last okay. uh, couple of weeks. And again, I, I would like to, to uh, with, uh, I appreciate all those, uh, it's, a, it's re reciprocal that I, I hear so many uh, words of appreciation for what okay. we have done for, for Ukraine and for the Ukrainians over the last couple of weeks. Okay. And you have a family? Uh, I'm here with my wife, okay. uh, now with, with my family because my kids are visiting. Um, and your wife is adult, here? Yes, my wife is here. And does she speak five or six languages also? She speaks, she speaks two. Wow, okay. And how many children do you have? We have two children. Our son is 26 and our daughter is 23. Uh, Are they in uh, journalism, private equity, something? <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> God forbid. Uh, my, my journalism my, or private equity? <laughs> <laughs> De dentistry. Right. No, no, it's not. Just joking. My, my daughter studies uh, film production back in Poland, so you can imagine how thrilled she was when she learned that uh, her dad would become the next uh, Polish president of the United States. I told her explicitly, if you have a million dollars to spare, go ahead, you can find someone who, will, who, who, who would finance your studies here. So I'm ready to do this, but um, it would be a... Um, and your son, what does he do? A tough decision. My son... Uh, this is a, a, a longer story. My son studied uh, health economics okay. in Poland at uh, one of the universities in Warsaw in English. And he uh, had, uh, he majored in uh, epidemiology, biostatistics, big data, and it was six months before the pandemic broke out. Okay. So, so he was pretty prescient, wasn't he? But are they in Poland now, Jackpot. your children? Sorry? Your children are in Poland? Uh, now they are here. Okay. But uh, they are permanently. And they like living in, in the United Washington or they like it? Uh, they've been here for a week, so uh, they are, you know, a, a little bit overwhelmed. Okay. And so uh, today, uh, what would you say is the biggest misconception that Americans have about Poland? I will tell you what's the biggest misconception among Israelis is, because this is what, I, what, what I've talked about. Uh, to them uh, about uh, on uh, several occasions. Many of those people who, for example, visited Poland on the so-called, I, I, I dislike this term, but for want of, of another one, I, I, I'm, I'm forced to use it, the Holocaust trips. 
because before the pandemic, about uh, nearly 40,000 young people in their teens were uh, visiting Poland. Uh, those were four or five day trips. And what they saw in Poland were mostly concentration camps. And then they were returning to Israel with that uh, you know, mental and psychological burden, with that tremendous trauma. So for many of them, 40,000 people annually. For many of them, the, the first and the only association with Poland was a huge graveyard. And then I, I talked to people in their 30s and 40s who returned to Poland for the first time in their adult lives. And they say, you know, we expected to see that huge graveyard. We expected to see a drab, gray, colorless, post-communist country in the middle of nowhere. And the only attraction uh, was Poland's cheapness. It's a cheap country for many Israelis. And then, they say, then we land in Warsaw and, it, and we see something um, different altogether. A modern country, a vibrant one, uh, in many spheres much more advanced, for example, technologically, than Israel, the startup nation. They were absolutely shocked when I uh, was telling them, for example, that during my three-year stint in Israel, I never had the opportunity to pay contactless with my credit card. Meanwhile, in Poland, when you walk into a, 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 a mall, you can hear that constant sound of someone paying with their mobile phones. Big, big, big. In Israel, impossible. You, you always have to swipe, let alone the checks, uh, which is a common characteristic. So today, uh, would you say the Polish economy is in reasonable shape? It is in a very good shape, especially when you compare uh, the, Pol the Polish economy to, uh, to France's or Germany's or Denmark or Sweden's, which are also doing relatively well. But uh, uh, for instance, during the pandemic, and thanks to some uh, countermeasures that the Polish government uh, undertook, uh, it, uh, I mean, the, uh, the consequences of the pandemic have not been, so, they have been painful, but not so uh, dramatic as in other European what, countries. What percentage of people in Poland are, are vaccinated now? Uh, it's about 60%. Uh, so it, it's, it's stalled, as in many other countries. We are not satisfied with this, uh, with this level, with the vaccination rate. I wish more people were vaccinated. But again, we are, we are now exiting this, this, the, the, the most dramatic phase of and, the pandemic. And if somebody wanted to visit Poland to, as a kind of a tourist thing, what, would they, what should they see? What would they most importantly visit? Uh, Warsaw, Krakow, Gdansk, uh, historical cities with uh, uh, impressive history, uh, remarkable past. Uh, but also, nature is, is pretty remarkable. And for example, the lakes in the northwestern part of Poland, the Tatra Mountains, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a big country. So you can travel around Poland and, and, and be surprised you know, at uh, every site. So you would expect that uh, this war is going to go on for at least another month or two. But in the end resolution, you expect it to be a peace agreement, an armistice, like we have in Korea, where there's not really a peace agreement, or what would you expect to be the resolution? I'm looking forward to Ukraine's victory. And I, do believe, I didn't believe uh, that Ukraine would prevail just three weeks ago. Now I do, not only because I have, uh, I have come to the conclusion that in terms of, of military tactics and strategy, uh, the Ukrainians are much better than the Russians, uh, which uh, also comes as, uh, as a surprise to me, but also because of the, all those uh, uh, weapons deliveries. We have transferred uh, uh, so, uh, so many arms, so, many, so much weaponry to Ukraine. The, the President Zelensky, whom I, I, um, 
I respect so much and appreciate him uh, and I admired uh, him for what he has done and uh, for the leadership. He's been com he, he, he's still complaining about our right. you know um, uh, laxness towards Russia and our lenient attitude and uh, he, he's uh, you know um, pushing us so hard. Uh, but I believe that we, 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 if we keep this pace of weapons deliveries to Ukraine, they will be cap capable of defending themselves in, much more effectively. In hindsight, had we had sanctions that were tougher earlier, before yeah. the invasion, or shipped more weapons over that were more significant weapons before the invasion, do you think it would have made a difference? Probably. I, I would like to remind you that uh, after the annexation of Crimea in 2014, uh, our relation, ours, the West's relations, if you will, with Russia uh, uh, returned to uh, business as usual in just a couple of months. Uh, if we had upheld those sanctions which were imposed after uh, Russia annexed Crimea in 2014 uh, uh, for a longer period of time, maybe the effects would have been uh, uh, more efficacious. So we have to be determined and willing to uh, keep the pressure on Russia, maybe for the next five, maybe for the next 10 years. But if, if Zelensky, on behalf of the Ukrainian government, says, look, keep Crimea and you can have the Donbass, I don't really care about that so much. He will he never agrees. say that. He will uh, never say that. Well, I'm, I, well I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of him because I can't, but uh, uh, he has already uh, he has already made that point uh, uh, on several occasions, and I don't think he will ever say that. Because also, internally, domestically, it would be very toxic and suicidal for him as as the, the as a Ukrainian leader. So, but any agreement that he agrees to is what you think the Western up allies to would agree to. It, it, well, it's up, it's up to him, of course. We can't we can't push him to, uh, okay. towards. Uh, a peace accord with Russia, okay. but on the other hand, uh, of course, we are, we are also, uh, I, I will tell you another thing which is pretty important. And sometimes this issue is um, overshadowed by the, by the military issues. Right. Uh, Ukraine's accession to the European Union. Ukraine has already uh, applied for membership, and I believe that if uh, Ukraine joins the European Union, this will be the most important achievement and, uh, and the crucial step in Ukraine's integration with the West. Okay. So if they, they, they can become EU members even during the war with Russia, but then that would be a game changer for Ukraine and for Europe as well. But you think if the Western allies had said a long time ago to uh, Ukraine, you're not going to be a member of NATO, it's just not realistic, that would have been more helpful in keeping Putin from wanting to go forward? Many Western politicians uh, uh, said this in the past, that Ukraine would never become, right. for example, the Bucharest summit in 2008, you, we all remember that, uh, that Ukraine and Georgia were promised uh, membership than uh, some uh, okay. Western countries opposed, uh, well, objected to that uh, very idea. But I believe, I, I would not rule out okay. uh, Ukraine becoming uh, a, a NATO member one day. But again, it's up to the Ukrainian society, it's up to the Ukrainian political leaders to, to make that choice. And again, Russia has no veto power over what other countries also in, the, in its immediate neighborhood, uh, which uh, alliances they join, which countries they want to, uh, to trade with, and what international organizations they want to be part of. So in your current position, do you ever deal with members of Congress? Well, many of them. And what is your impression of them? There is a bipartisan consensus, consensus on uh, what we should do and what, what uh, pressure we should exert uh, on Russia. We, we, uh, they, they see and they perceive the eastern flank and the eastern part of Europe as absolutely vital, in terms, also in terms of America's security interests and security concerns, which is a good sign, of course, we are working on it to Thanks. persuade even more uh, American lawmakers and opinion makers uh, of, the, of the real significance and of the importance of, of uh, not only Poland, but also of other countries in the region. 
Well, I want to thank you for all the information you've given us, and thank you for giving us this time. And I, I wish I could give you more information, especially well, can, uh, after that meeting of our Well, you want, to, you want ministers. to keep your job, so I know you can't do everything. Uh, but let me give you a little gift from uh, the club, if I could. Here it is. Oh. It's a little historic map of the District of Columbia for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.